So let's start our um, afternoon sessions with three more um, speakers. And our first speaker this afternoon is um, Suzanne Scharf. Uh, Suzanne is a doctoral candidate at the uh, Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany. Um, she also received her MA there in American Studies and Art History. She holds a diploma in American Studies from Smith College as well. From 2007 to 2009, she was assistant curator at the, I didn't even ask you how to pronounce this, Busserius? Yeah. Busserius Kunstforum in Hamburg, where she helped to organize and contributed to the catalogs of two exhibitions, High Society American Portraits of the Gilded Age and Modern Life, Edward Hopper and His Time. Since 2010, she has worked as an assistant professor in the departments of English and American Studies at Hamburg University and at Goethe University. In 2011, uh, she was a Terra Foundation for American Art pre-doctoral fellow at um, Smithsonian American Art Museum. And Suzanne's talk this afternoon is George Bellows and Hugo Reisinger, A Study of Patronage. In 1911, George Bellows Up the Hudson entered the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It was the second painting by Bellows to enter a collection of an established museum. The first museum to acquire a painting by Bellows had been the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, which had bought the landscape North River in 1909, after it had won a Hall Garden Prize at the National Academy of Design in 1908. Afterwards, Bellows had sent it to several exhibitions, including the annual exhibition of the Pennsylvania Academy of Design in 1909, which led to its sale. To be represented now in 1911 with the work in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum at such an early stage of his career must have been a major, of major significance for Bellows, who was only 28 years old at the time. And according to his own account, as Melissa reminded us yesterday, Bellows actually uh, went to the Met excessively, excessively on what he called his European tour. So the Metropolitan Museum of Art did not acquire Bellows' work on its own initiative, though. The painting was a gift to the museum by Hugo Reisinger, a German-American businessman and art collector from New York City. Reisinger, however, not only presented up the Hudson to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but he also bought a Bellows for his own collection, and included Bellows' work in international exhibitions he organized. With these three functions, as art collector, donor to museum, and exhibition organizer, Reisinger was of singular importance for Bellows in his early career. No other early buyer of Bellows' works had been supportive of Bellows on these three levels, and vice versa. Bellows was the only American artist that Reisinger supported in this triple manner. In this talk, I will look into Reisinger's patronage of Bellows. I will discuss what kind of works were the focus of his patronage, what circumstances might have influenced Reisinger's choices, and the selection and presentation of the works. Studying this example of patronage will give, a, will give us some insight into the American art world in the early 20th century, into its institutions and its networks in general. Studies of patronage can be quite difficult. While we might have the objects and the names connected to them, we often don't have any documents available about the personal exchanges between the people, the artist, the gallerist, the collector, who are involved in the exchange of art objects. As long as words of appreciation, inquiries about a work and its sale are not exchanged in letters, we don't know anything about these conversations, which would give us insights about artists' and patrons' relations and opinions. This is true in the case of Bellows and Reisinger, because we don't have any letters of exchange between them. However, I will take the objects, Bellows' paintings, 
and traces they left in the time of Reisinger's patronage to create a more complete picture of how this kind of patronage worked and what implications it had. I will first briefly introduce Reisinger before I will discuss Reisinger's acquisition of a painting by Bellows for his collection. Then I will talk about the inclusion of Bellows' work in international exhibitions, and finally, about Reisinger's donation of Abda Hudson to the Metropolitan Museum. Hugo Reisinger was a German-American businessman who is known today mainly as a benefactor to the Bush Reisinger Museum in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He was born near Wiesbaden, Germany in 1856 and immigrated to the US in the 1880s. A decade later, he had established a successful import and export business in New York City. Reisinger was also a well-known collector of American and European art at his time, and I'm showing you here a portrait that the Swedish artist Andres Zorn painted of Reisinger in 1907. Around 1905, he started spending a good amount of his time, energy, and money on advancing an active exchange between the US and Germany in the realm of fine arts. He initiated a major exhibition of contemporary German art in the US, which was shown in 1909 at the Metropolitan Museum, the Copley Society in Boston, and the Art Institute Chicago. A year later, he organized the first major exhibition of American art in Germany, which was shown in Berlin and Munich, and to which I will get a little later. The same year, the critic Christian Brinton published two articles on Reisinger's collection in the International Studio, giving us an impression of the collection in his home. In 1911, the Reisinger family moved into a mansion on Fifth Avenue across the Metropolitan Museum after Adolphus Busch, the St. Louis uh, Brewer, beer brewer, had given this house as a gift to his daughter at May, Reisinger's wife. And here's just another street view at the top. And the inside of the mansion, originally built for Louis Stern in 1887, was photographed in about 1911. And I'm showing you here a few of the images which let us see some of the works in Reisinger's collection up on the wall. Um, and we can see the Anderson portrait that we just, oops, saw here. I don't know if the pointer works. Apparently it doesn't. Um, Okay, well, you see it in the middle of the, on the right wall. Um, here we see a couple of landscape paintings, maybe a Thomas Wilmer doing on the left. Um, here on the left, we see a fish still alive by Chase, and this is the Rising Us breakfast room. And here the hallway on the second floor showing Melcher's two sisters on the left in the middle. After Reisinger's death in 1914, the majority of the works from his collection was auctioned off in 1916, comprising 20, uh, 259 works altogether, of which 173 works were done in oil or pastel, 64 were etchings and color prints, and 22 watercolors and gouache paintings. In 1910, Reisinger acquired a painting from Bellows for his collection, A Morning Snow, Hudson River which Bellows had painted in January of that year. Between 1908 and 1912, Bellows chose repeatedly to depict the edges of Manhattan, views of the Hudson River showing industrialization encroaching upon nature, but also scenes along the East River and riverfront paintings featuring vessels and dock workers. As Carol Troyan pointed out in the catalog accompanying last year's Bellows retrospective, especially the views from Riverside Park across the Hudson, also called North River, got raving reviews and attracted buyers, private as well as institutional ones. Spurred on by the positive reviews and, um, and possible sales, and of also is uh, in instant recognition, as mentioned before, North River won Bellows a Hall Garden Prize at the National Academy of Design the year that he painted it, Bellows produced several of such winter scenes along the Hudson. How popular these paintings became in those years is also shown by the price a painting like Morning Snow went for. Reisinger had bought it in 1910 for the substantial sum of $500, but when it was auctioned off in 1916, following Reisinger's death in 1914, um, so only six years later, it went for more than double the price, $1,075. 
Rising up probably saw a morning snow Hudson River when Bellows exhibited it at the National Arts Club in 1910, and they might have even known each other personally through the club since both were members. Reisinger might have been attracted to the painting because among the American paintings in his collection, landscape paintings were especially prominent. We find works by painters such as Henry Trachtman, Child Hassam, Jasper Francis Murphy, Walter Elmer Schofield, and Radfield, and also views along the Palisades by Ernest Lawson and Leon Darbo, both purchased in 1911. So although Reisinger selected all kinds of genres for his collection, he appears to have been particularly interested in contemporary American landscapes, among them Hudson River views. However, Lawson's and Darbo's views of the Palisades are much tamer than Bellows. No traces of industrialization are visible, nor are people. He might have been especially attracted to Bellows' work due to its painterly quality with the broad, vigorous brushwork and paint put on with the palette knife, which reminds me also of the way some of the German secessionist painters such as Max Liebermann and Max Leifogt worked, painters whose works Reisinger's collected as well. Another factor in Reisinger's acquisition of a morning snow, Hudson River, might have been his friendship with Gary Melchers. And I'm showing you here Melchers' double and self-portrait in the studio of 1912, which testifies to their friendship. In 1906, Melchers became the official artistic advisor to the Telfair Academy of Art and Sciences in Savannah, Georgia, and was authorized, and I quote, to make purchases on the museum's behalf. He served in this position until 1916 and unofficially even through the 1920s. And when we compare the American section of Reisinger's collection with the works Melchers acquired for the Telfair Academy, we can see some striking similarities. For example, Melchers bought a scene very similar to Morning Snow, Hudson River, for the Telfair Academy, namely Snow-capped River, which Bellows painted in 1911. So although this is a year later than Reisinger purchased his Bellows, Melchers might have had a role in advising Reisinger on what paintings might be worth buying. How daring the selection of Morning Snow might have actually been for Reisinger becomes clear when we consider the location of the work in his home. Here we can see it hanging in the middle of the wall on the right. This appears to be the hallway on the third floor of Reisinger's mansion on Fifth Avenue, on which would have been his son's rooms, for example, but no rooms where one might entertain guests. Also next to it, we see another scene, very unusual for Reisinger's collection, showing a muscular worker carrying something. This is a painting by the German artist and president of the Royal Academy of the Fine Arts in Berlin, Arthur Kampf, titled Men at Work. Reisinger purchased the painting from the artist in Berlin in 1906. While Kampf is an academic and very conventional painter for the time, the subject matter is very unusual for Reisinger's collection. In 1906, Reisinger had also asked Kampf to paint a portrait of the Kaiser which he intended to include in the exhibition of contemporary German art he wanted to organize for the US. The commission of the portrait, as well as the purchase of this painting, might have been a way of Reisinger trying to win Kampf's support for his exhibition project, because he was an important um, person in the Berlin art world. Bellows' Morning Snow doesn't have to see much in common with Kampf's Men at Work, except for the inclusion of labor in both paintings, although on a very different scale. However, maybe this for Reisinger's collection unusual subject matter, as well as Bellow's vigorous handling of paint and daring composition, might have been reason enough not to hang it in the main rooms in the vicinity of tonalist landscapes, American Impressionists, and Barbizon-inspired scenes. When Reisinger organized his exhibition of American art for Berlin and Munich in 1910, he also chose to include Bellow's work. However, it is unclear which works were actually shown because there are only very few sources that speak of two works. The exhibition catalog included only one, namely the British Blackwalls Island, which you see here. So again, a river view. If there was a second one, it might have possibly been Summer Night Riverside Drive, which you can view upstairs right now. It is mentioned in the record books, but as you can see, the entry of the exhibition 
was later put in parentheses. It was mentioned by one critic, however, in an article preceding the show, so we don't know whether it actually traveled. To give you an impression on what company of paintings the bridge Blackwell's Island was shown, I will give you an overview of the planning of the exhibition and what kind of works were included. Rising's explicit goal and drive for organizing the exhibition of American art in Germany had been, in its words as quoted in the American Art News, mainly to make known in Germany the work of contemporary American artists. My official friends abroad and I believe that the time has come when American art should attain due recognition abroad. The aim of this exhibition is also to promote artistic reciprocity between two great nations." Unquote. Furthermore, he wanted to establish a market for American artists in Europe, thus many paintings were actually for sale. The exhibition certainly achieved Reisinger's first goal since it was covered by all the major German art magazines, and I'll mention a few of those critical voices later. As for the artistic reciprocity, this remained wishful thinking for now since the reaction of the German art critics was less than enthusiastic. For the selection of the works in the US, Reisinger sent out invitations to artists, asking them to submit works to this exhibition. In writing to Gary Melchers, he is very satisfied about the promising outcome of this procedure. And I quote a translation um, from a letter from November 26 in 1909. He wrote to Melchers in German. Word of the project of an American exhibition has spread to the public and meets everywhere with greatest enthusiasm, not the least among the artists them th themselves. All of them pledge to let me have their best. If the fellows actually keep their word, this is bound to be a truly phenomenal show, and our German brethren will find no end to their astonishment." Unquote. This sho shows that Reisinger had high hopes for the exhibition and its reception in Germany. Such hopes were shared by the American Art News, which were convinced that this was a promising undertaking. And I quote, Mr. Reisinger, we hope and believe, will give Europe that long-desired opportunity of seeing a typically representative exhibit of American pictures, unquote. Besides inviting artists directly to contribute to the exhibition and going personally to their studios to discuss works to be sent in, Reisinger approached private collectors such as, such as Charles Lang Freer, as well as museums such as the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, asking them for specific pieces in their collections. From these two museums in particular, he sought to lend pieces that would serve the purpose of giving an overview of the development of American art over the past 50 years. In the end, the exhibition consisted of 206 works. And I will show you the following slides, or I have shown you the following slides, just to give you a quick impression in addition to the ones we have already seen. They were mainly oil paintings, but also a few watercolors by Whistler, as well as several etchings by Whistler and Joseph Pennell. More than 50% of the works were landscapes, seascapes, and cityscapes. About 90 paintings involved figures, 20 of them were portraits, and the others either figure studies or genre paintings. However, he could not have imagined the general tenor of the reviews. While Reisinger had meant to show that by now American painters were on a par with their European colleagues, this was not what German critics were mainly looking for. Critics recognized the technical abilities of several artists, and some painters were especially praised for their works, such as William Merritt Chase's Lady with a White Shawl, which was, and I quote, not only good painting, but showed a the American lady, as a critic in Deutsche Kunst und Dekoration pointed out. However, even when they praised their technical abilities, critics frequently complained that the paintings were missing a certain inherent conviction. Also, the overly refinement and perceived feminization of art was gazed, with its harsh criticism of the Boston School, Paul Clement in Die Kunst für Alle, almost appears to have th sought revenge for the negative reviews the German art exhibition had received in Boston the previous year. Most often, however, critics, writers criticized that in many paintings one could see the European precursor. Besides, some critics did not see artists such as Whistler, Melchers, and Sargent as American painters at all. 
The general tenor which tinted many reviews negatively was that German critics doubted that there was a truly American art. They didn't think that American art had reached a level of being a national art, the expression of a nation yet. To me, this appears to have been more problem of what was depicted than of aesthetics. It was, for example, criticized that among the landscapes, there wasn't a single one that depicted the Indian summer that New England was known for even in Germany. In the popular press, it showed that Germans whose image of America had been formed by Cooper's leather stocking tales, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, and Karl May's novels imagining a Wild West might have been disappointed by the lack of Western scenes. Only about 4% of the paintings featured a Western subject matter, among them Henry Farney's The Talking Wire, or The Song of the Talking Wire. The artist receiving the most praise was Joseph Pennell, whose etchings of industrial sites and views of New York City filled almost a whole cabinet, and writers deplored that there were not more works with subject matter like his. In the light of these critical voices, and especially the singling out of Pennell, it is astounding that German critics did not mention Bellows in their reviews. One would think that such a New York cityscape as the British Blackwell's Island should have caught their attention. In the US, Reisinger's undertaking of the American Art Exhibition was very positively received. This must certainly have played a role in appointing Reisinger as head of the Fine Arts Committee of the American section at, at the Anglo-American Exhibition in 1914. And I only want to briefly show the works of Bellows that were included in this exhibition. The 1907 Little Girl in White, Queenie Burnett, and Man of the Dock and the Circus, both of 1912. And while they were very different subject matter, they all had in common that they had previously won prizes in the US so that might have played a role in selecting these works. Coming back to Reisinger's donation of Up the Hudson to the Metropolitan Museum, I want to point out that Reisinger was not in general a big donor to museums. He actually only gave one other painting to the Metropolitan Museum because most of his finances were tied up in the exhibitions he organized of American art in Germany and German art in the US. Interestingly, the only other painting that he donated to the Metropolitan Museum was a contemporary German work of a painter who was rather conservative, however very popular in Germany at the time, Hans Thomas at Lake Garda of 1907. This shows again that Reisinger was eager to make German art known in the US. In a letter of February 14, 1911, which Reisinger sent to Bryson Burroughs, curator at the Metropolitan Museum. It becomes clear that Reisinger had offered the museum also a gift, though, of a pa painting by Henry Golden Dearth. However, since Burroughs apparently didn't care much for it, Reisinger abstained from offering it to the museum. Regarding Up the Hudson, however, Burroughs had expressed his admiration, and Reisinger called Spellows, I quote, one of your best landscapists today, unquote. The letter also reveals that originally Reisinger had intended to give the painting to the National Museum in Munich. Since the Metropolitan Museum wanted the painting very much for its collection, Reisinger decided to give it to them, believing, and I quote Reisinger, it will do more good there for the young artist than it will in Europe, unquote. Thus, Bellows up the Hudson entered the Metropolitan Museum's collection. To summarize my findings, Reisinger's support of Bellows in three ways, by collecting his work, giving his work to a major museum, and including him in exhibitions, shows that Bellows held a significant importance for Reisinger, who apparently saw in him one of the most noteworthy American artists of his time. The kind of works Reisinger collected and donated to the Metropolitan Museum, respectively, featured not the most avant-garde subject matter from our perspective today, but fit in with Reisinger's somewhat conservative taste in collecting, it might have even been somewhat daring for him. For Bellows, on the other hand, rising a support on several levels, which gave his work additional exposure nationally and internationally, must have been substantial, considering that he was still in the early stages of his career and had no other patron who fostered him in this way. Thank you.
we have questions? Um, thank you very much for your talk. I wondered what kind of correspondence is there between Reisinger and Bellows dealers around the sale of the paintings? Um, actually, none. And he, um, as far as I can say, he bought the painting directly from Bellows because in the auction catalog of 1916, it sometimes includes when Reisinger and how he bought it. So if he bought it from a gallerist, it would say like bought from Nödler, for example. Um, but in this case, it says bought directly from the artist. So apparently, they must have known each other and there was no exchange through the gallery. Am I next? Okay, thank you, Suzanne. Um, so it's very interesting to see the sort of transatlantic impact that, that Bellas was having um, at that early stage in his career. Since my paper that you're about to hear is about Bellows and, and his sort of anti-German sentiments during the First World War and the, the latter part of the First World War. I'm kind of curious about Reisinger himself. The, your dates show that he was from 1860 to 1920. Was he living in the United States during the First World War? And do you know anything about how he was reacting to the anti-German sentiment that was you know, becoming so strong? Actually, Reisinger was uh, in Germany in the summer of 1914 because he often spent the summer months there. And he died before he could return to the US. He died in September 1914. Uh, and then was, or his body was brought back to the US to be um, put in the cemetery of um, Woodlawn Cemetery in New York City. Um, so no, I, there was no reaction yeah, to what was He avoided there. the whole thing yeah. by dying. Yeah, he died. <laughs> <laughs> it was very smart of him. So. Uh, great lecture. Uh, is there any work by Bellows in German museums, and is he understood at all now in Germany, or is that something you're hoping to change? <laughs> well, I don't think that there is any work of Bellows in a German museum, and I also think that most Germans are really not aware of Bellows' work. And yes, he was included in like the few exhibitions of American art that have taken place in Germany, um, but I don't think he gets much of a response in Germany at all. And of course, it would be great to change that. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to ask, um, what other patrons were at the same period would you like in rising a two? Are there other people that you see, other uh, either German American or, or um, patrons who are? Um, first or second generation migrants to the US who work in this way? Are there other um, patrons that you would see him as being comparable to in the kind of um, activities that he, he, under, he undertakes? For Bellows? Uh, well, I mean, I mean, for Bellows specifically, obviously, I mean, you explained that he was in some ways unique uh, well, the thing is in that his I relationship to Bellows, but to other, to elsewhere as well, could you say what, what it, does he fit with a kind of a, a, a pattern or a, a pattern of taste or of activity that you could see others working in similar ways? So, right, uh, patrons for fellows? Or Maybe, I, I, I guess more generally, that kind of sense of what other patrons at that time working with American artists, perhaps, or that, that you could see operating in the New York art world that you could see comparisons to or parallels with? Or distinctions well, from? I mean, of course, a little later, you, for example, have Gertrude Winnebald Whitney, who buys works from the Ashkin School and includes the, uh, those works in exhibitions that he sends, she's also sends abroad. And yes, she also can um, collect on a much grander scale because she's just much more wealthy than Reisinger. Mm -hmm. I mean, Reisinger had a successful business, and so in that kind of um, respect, was wealthy, but it was, he was not as wealthy at all like Whitney, for example, or even like his father-in-law, Adolphus Bush. So, I mean, it's interesting to see that the mansion on Fifth Avenue <laughs> was not paid by Reisinger's money, but actually by Bush's money. Um, and Whitney, yes, she buys a Bellows, I think also around this time, 1912, 1912 or so, but also only um, starts later to include 
fellows in international exhibition. So I think right at this time, there's no other patron who supports fellows in that way. Uh, thinking about some of the, the images that you showed from his co collection, I liked your paper very much, by the, by, by the way. And one of, the, one of the things I got to thinking in thinking about some of these images is thinking about, you know, okay, so you got Christian Brinton, who's obsessed with Swedish and Norwegian art, and you have people like Zorn. Is there, is there an identifiably Nordic taste, a taste for Nordic landscape at some le level in Reisinger's cl collecting, do you think? And if so, how much could we possibly read into that and extrapolate from it? Well, I would say um, Scandinavian artists were part of his collection, but they don't play like a major role. I think they are, like there are many French landscapes also in his collection and uh, many German works, of course. So it's, it's more like a, almost an equal distribution. And I would say overall, there are probably um, fewer Scandinavian landscapes than French, for example. But Anders Zorn was an artist that he collected more extensively. My, most of the painters he collected, um, he bought only like one, one or two works. So it's not unusual that he only bought one Bellows paintings. Um, with Anders Zorn, it's a little bit different. He bought at least like three paintings by him and also a lot of um, etchings. And so I think Anders Zorn plays a different role um, for Reisinger than many other artists at the time. And again, Zorn also, uh, for example, did a portrait of Adolphus Busch. So we have these family connections here too. Uh, Zorn travels around, goes to St. Louis, paints Busch, and it might be that actually Reisinger got to know him in St. Louis or, or later on. Um, so I think these personal connections always play a role too in what kind of works he collects. That's, yeah, I, that's very well, well put. I, I hadn't thought of it quite like, like that. Um, honestly, I hadn't thought about much at all about rising or beyond the museum at Harvard until you really brought, wonderfully brought this to our atten attention. But I would just say that, you know, the bellows he happens to have really do tap into some uh, ideas about kind of uh, northern romanticism mm -hmm. and, and northern romantic land, landscape mm -hmm. painting. So. Thank you. I mean, you, you sort of showed the German critics panning <laughs> his exhibition, but was there any lingering um, uh, uh, consequence of that, of that show that you see in, in the German art world or in Berlin at the time? Um, not that much, actually. I mean, a few works probably were sold, but we don't have any records of that. Um, and also, there are no records left at the Royal Academy in Berlin because all those records burned during uh, World War II. So, like, we don't have any lists of sales, for example. Um, one artist who was more popular and known in Germany was Gary Malchus, but that, again, was not due to the show, but actually because he was also a professor in Weimar at the time. Um, and, for example, the uh, National Museum in Berlin owns the Malchus painting. But other than that, there are not that many American paintings and German collections at all from that time. Any other questions? No? All right, great. Well, thank, thank you so much. much.